Welcome to the Efficient Spend podcast, where we help marketers turn media spend into revenue. My guest today is Sonia Sierra. Sonia, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'd love if we could start just by uh, giving some context into your experience with optimizing marketing spend. I know you've been at a, a few startups, but would love if you could just share some of your experience. Yeah, for sure. So uh, my background is in paid acquisition. I've been in that world for 10 plus years now. I started out agency side. So I did a few agencies, small, medium, large agencies. My big agency days were at Mediacom in New York City, uh, working on clients like Shell, um, AB InBev, Bud Light, um, Stella Artois, those sort of brands, uh, and mostly running paid search and paid social campaigns there. And then I moved uh, in-house to net a porte so um, high-end fashion, e-com, um, also overseeing paid search and paid social agencies. And I've been in ed tech for a while. So I was in ed tech for about seven years, uh, overseeing paid acquisition programs for General Assembly for four years, which is the largest tech boot camp in the world. Uh, and then was at Skillshare for about a year, overseeing their acquisition program. Uh, and then an earlier stage startup called Career Karma, also in the tech boot camp space. Um, and my latest move is to nuts.com, so into the food space. I'm um, their senior director of growth marketing, overseeing everything for acquisition, both paid and organic. I've been here for about two months, uh, overseeing the internal team that we're building and also external agencies. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And uh, definitely a wide variety of experience, experiences managing paid for different um, sizes of companies, different categories, and an interesting pivot into nuts.com. Um, I love to start with just kind of talking through setting acquisition goals and North Stars. It's obviously a little bit different for different companies. Some companies may be more um, acquisition focused for customer volume, some are revenue focused, but mm -hmm. when you come into a company and you're thinking about setting uh, North Star targets specifically for growth and paid teams, how do you kind of think about that? Yeah. So like you said, it's it's different for all different types of companies, um, but I'll just use this, this one as an example, like coming into nuts.com since I just started about two months ago. Um, when you're coming into a new company, oftentimes you're coming into their their structure and their goals that are already set. So that's kind of what I'm seeing a lot here, where they have their their acquisition goals set for the year that they worked on with uh, with agencies in partnership with internal teams, and you kind of have to figure out um, where where your place is in something something that's already existing. Um, so that's that's kind of interesting to kind of slot in and see how how we can hit existing goalposts that were set before you arrived. Um, so that's its its own sort of sort of challenge. Um, sometimes you'll come into a company like my previous company. I was the first marketing hire um, and you're coming in and they're there are no goals. Um, so you're kind of in charge of, you know, looking at the landscape of all the channels that we have at our disposal, um, coming up with some test plans, seeing what we could possibly hit, um, start testing things, start getting some sort of baseline numbers, um, and then then building up your plan from there. Um, but, but each company is different. And Kind of a big difference that I've noticed between different sort of stages of companies and types of companies is that your goals are either going to be set from like top down or bottoms up. Uh, so I prefer <laughs> the the bottoms up approach, and I'll kind of talk about why. Uh, but the sort of tops down approach, you see that a lot in the kind of earlier stage growth growth stage companies um, where they have, you know, VC money that has recently come in and they have a, a board that's kind of helping set these targets. Um, and you're expected to grow pretty rapidly. Um, so that's kind of one side of it. Uh, and then the other side is the sort of bottoms up approach where 
you know, the the senior leadership team of the company will during planning process will come to us as the as the acquisition team and and have us put together what the plan looks like. What is achievable? Um, what can we do to grow next year? What sort of bets do we want to take? What sort of test budget do we need? And then we're the ones putting that together. Um, I feel like that works a little bit better because you're using sort of like actual historical data and knowledge from the team to build out like what what an what an actual plan looks like um, versus sort of just like you're going to need to grow forty percent. Uh, good luck. <laughs> I've been part of that top-down approach in the past. A previous startup that I worked with gave us specific targets that did not seemingly have a lot of data behind them that we could actually hit those targets or, or analysis behind that. So I definitely resonate with going through a bottoms-up approach. However, that also brings me to something that I've kind of been struggling with and, and thinking about, which is how do you set individual targets in different channels that have widely different sources of attribution, right? You can have uh, a North Star acquisition goal. We want to acquire this many customers. We want to drive this much in, in revenue. And then you have all of these different channels that have little nuances that might have individual targets that you set. When you think about those individual targets and what is essentially profitable spend, how do you kind of think about that? Yeah, so that's something that I'm grappling with right now as well. Um so what they used to do at nuts.com before I got here um, with the agency that they brought on was, you know, they didn't want to be held back by all of those nuances per channel, for example. So they had sort of like a, a blended, um, our, our North Star metric for acquisition is an LTV to CAC ratio. So we basically want to hit um, a, a one LTV to CAC over a certain period of time. Uh, and what they did in the beginning was they said, okay, all of these channels have nuances. Um, let's have a blended LTV to CAC goal across all channels paid in organic. And let's just try to optimize the top line and get as much kind of like order and revenue growth as we can. Um, so that's kind of where they, where they started out for about six months. And then what they realized is that there was a lot of wasted spend between channels um, when you're only looking at one blended goal. So then they swung the exact opposite way and where we are right now is is too conservative. So we're on not even channel by channel, but uh, like all of the different um, tactics within each channel have to hit a certain LTV to CAC goal. Um, so that means Google Pmax has to hit uh, Google search has to hit Google shopping, like everything broken out has to hit this goal. Um, and so, yeah, we, we swung in the other direction where we're, we're really sort of held back in, in how we can scale and spend, um, by being so tight there. So what I am working on right now is I agree with you. There's no sort of like one size fits all approach to the different channels. So how do you make sure that you're treating them separately and are able to grow? So I'm basically looking at different measurement platforms to bring on. Um, so I've been having conversations with five different potential partners uh, to help me solve that problem. So there's a couple partners on the multi-touch attribution side. So speaking with Northbeam and Rockerbox are kind of like the two big ones. Uh, and then speaking to companies more in like the incrementality space. Um, so speaking to um, Measured and Lift Lab. And also, you know, the hot new topic is MMM, which is funny because that's like the hot old topic from like Mad Men days. Uh, but it's definitely coming back around. Um, so I've been speaking with um, Recast, but just get kind of getting the lay of the land of like, what are what are our options? Because right now we're on, 
you know, last click tactic by tactic, just like really held back. Um, and we're not going to be able to scale that way. So I think it depends for, for different companies, um, and kind of their, their stage and their goals. Um, I think where, where we're leaning is something like Lift Lab, which actually kind of combines incrementality testing and MMM, which is really interesting. Um, but I think that's going to be the key for us is just getting a different view from what we have uh, that, that allows us to scale like those upper funnel channels, for example. Like we, don't have, we don't have the opportunity to even test into something like YouTube or TikTok necessarily um, because we're just worried that there's no way it's going to back out to a last click um, kind of conversion focused KPI. Sure. Yeah, I've uh, chatted with a lot of those those partners as well, and it's a very difficult problem to solve. It would be easy to just say, what is our source of truth? What I'm finding is that there isn't a source of truth, really. There are multiple sources of measurement that you have to look at holistically to come up with some sort of directionality into making a decision. Um, in past companies like perhaps General Assembly or Skillshare, I'm wondering if, if some of the previous companies you've worked at have had web and app um, acquisition where there are there's not only a web last click, but maybe there's SCAD network, right? And things like that. Um, you mentioned YouTube, but just kind of talking through different channels may have different sources of measurement and trying to kind of glean, should I be allocating more budget into this thing that uh, looks worse, but it's also a different lens that you're looking at it? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's where these measurement platforms come into play. Uh, I don't have a ton of experience on the app side. Uh, at Career Karma, they, they had an app as well, but we weren't focused on growing it. It was more just like web lead gen focused. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the whole reason that I'm looking to bring on one of these partners uh, is because we don't have an easy way right now within Google Analytics tracking, for example, to be able to run those top of funnel channels. Um, I'm actually like short term looking at how we can do YouTube. Like, is there a way to sort of hack something together where we come up with what the upper funnel KPIs are. Like maybe it's views or impressions or cost per view, something like that, and make sure everybody's aligned and then try to see, okay, if that's the only channel that we're launching right now and we put a significant enough budget against it, do we see an overall lift to orders like during that time period? Um, that's probably how I'm going to do it in the short term. Um, and then in the, in the longer term, when we bring on one of these partners, you kind of are able to see the incrementality of different, different channels, regardless of where they are in the funnel. Um, and that's going to help you be able to, to launch, not only launch, but, but see success uh, in something beyond last click. To me, there's, diminishing returns within different funnel stages, but last click has you over optimizing and overspending in the lower funnel to get that good looking performance. Exactly. I was just saying yesterday, it's like, we don't have a ton of upper funnel running right now and we're just clawing at the bottom of the funnel. Uh, and you're not, you're not feeding, feeding the bottom of the funnel with this strategy. So there's, it's really hard to grow in that way. There's a ton of scale in the upper funnel, but unless you are able to measure it and to your point, like have everyone aligned on how you're going to measure it, that's really the biggest challenge because, you know, you can measure things however you want. Um, but if, you know, senior leadership doesn't agree with your upper funnel measurement tactics, then the test is a failure and you're not going to get budget for it. Sure. At the end of the day, you have this North Star of CAC to LTV, and this is something that a lot of companies set as their, their target, which takes attribution out of the 
picture to a certain extent. There's different ways that you can um, measure CAC. There's performance CAC, total CAC. There's there's different ways to to do it. But I wonder, you know, if you're if you're looking at that that ratio, and you have all of these tools at your disposal that you can make changes to try to reduce CAC and increase LTV. If you're not thinking about attribution, how do you kind of think about that, right? If we want to reduce CAC, is it just reducing spend? Is it going into to different channels? Um, yeah. Um, so it, it's it's a bunch of different things to your point. Um, you know, channel by channel, how you're going to think about it is all of the sort of optimization levers you have. And honestly, I feel like as as the years go on, there's there are less and less levers within the channels. Um, so that's something that we're grappling with right now. Um, you know how we can increase performance on these channels that that are sort of tried and true. And I'm sure you can guess that they're Google and Facebook, uh, and the majority of our Google spend is on. Performance Max, Pmax, and there's really only so much you can do, um, you know, these days. So you know that that's one where you're kind of like, what levers do we have within the channels? Maybe your reps have some ideas, but it's not really going to be a silver bullet. Um, so what I'm thinking about more is um, things like offer testing anything like product flow related, like maybe we want to test a, a quiz flow that leads into a bundle um, that has an offer, that sort of thing. Creative testing is really big for us right now. We had our agency uh, doing our creative for about a year. Um, and we recently brought that in house as we brought on a new kind of head of um, head of our creative team. Uh, so that's been really fun, like dabbling into UGC and video. Uh, so there's a lot of optimization to be had there. And then launching new channels is a big one for us too. I think that that's something that we're willing to invest in right now. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of changes going on, you know, across all channels. And it's a little bit of like doomsday talk on on the LinkedIn sphere of, you know, AI and how that's going to impact all of these platforms that we rely so heavily on. Like, will AI replace uh, search engines and you know, your brain starts to spin? And, oh my God, if there's no more Google, that's like, you know, a big percentage of our spend. Um, so, you know, taking a step back and, and grounding yourself in reality, but testing new channels is really important. We're going to be testing um, a DSP this month, um, see if we can get some leverage there. Um, going to be testing into TikTok, and I mentioned YouTube. Uh, and and I think a big one also is, is finding a way to test into those upper funnel channels to just gain more awareness to feed the lower funnel. Yeah, for sure. It, it feels like there is less work to be done on the campaign management side from a paid marketer's perspective. And it's more about testing into new channels. And I think creative testing is probably the the biggest lever that, that you have. Again, you can, different channels have the ability to bid to different things and you can test different audiences and there's always going to be new campaign categories coming out. But I personally believe creative is one of the the biggest ones. Um, when you think about building out kind of like a creative testing strategy, right? Do you, do you kind of start with here's different themes I want to test, or here's different messaging for different areas of the funnel, or here's different channels or kind of creative types that you want to go into? Just kind of curious because I'm owning a lot of this at. Um, self right now. And the way that I built my creative roadmap out is to be based on what are my individual channel needs to make sure that I'm not hitting creative fatigue and then I can be testing volume in each channel. What are the products I'm promoting? And then what are the value props within those products that I want to understand? But curious when you build out creative testing strategies in, in the past, how you kind of thought about it. Yeah. Um, so it's actually something that we're doing right now at nuts.com. Um, 
So because we have that new hire and the creative team, I've been working really closely with him kind of coming up with this testing strategy. Uh, basically what we've come up with is since a lot of our, um, our ads are product feed focused and there's not a ton of kind of creative variances. Uh, so, so those sort of run within Pmax and, uh, Facebook DPA and there's small things to test there. If there's like different holidays and like, you know, um, and cards and things like that. Uh, but a lot of our focus right now is on Facebook creative testing. So for Facebook, we've been able to make DPA and Advantage Plus work for us and scale, but we haven't been able to make what we're calling Facebook evergreen. Um, so non-product focused ads. We haven't been able to have those hit our LTV to CAC goal and be able to scale. Um, so we're doing, we're focusing a lot of our creative testing there. Basically what we've come up with is we're doing these two week sprints um, where he and I will be brainstorming every two weeks of these, like you mentioned, these sort of like themes that we want to try. Um, and we're going to create them and then let them run for two weeks and anything that shows any promise, we're basically going to move to a new campaign um, and give it a little bit more time and see if anything kind of comes through. Um, but the way that we split it up is we create six, uh, six creatives for each two week sprint, two static, two GIF, two video. Um, our original idea was to really focus on video. Um, but Actually, surprisingly, there was some pushback from our agency that they also wanted uh, GIF and static. Uh, so they have seen historically in our account static performing the best. I feel like it's a bit of like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy where like we didn't have good video, so static performed well. Um, so we kind of met in the middle, and I, and I like this approach because um, I think there's a time and a place for static as well, um, even sort of standing out from from all of the UGC video that you see these days on Facebook. Um, so anyways, that's that's kind of our strategy. Uh, we're coming up with different themes every two weeks um, and fleshing them out and then creating them. Um, and we'll be on this kind of two week testing cadence until we find something that hopefully works. Yeah, it's funny how these feedback loops work when you see Static is performing the best, so we're just going to do more and more static. And in our head, video just doesn't perform. Sometimes people make these like mental notes, and then they're like, "Yeah, video just doesn't work for us." And it's like, "Well, you tried this, this, and this. Well, maybe not." Um, I, I actually think that there's a a lot of uh, usefulness and utility in static and GIF style ads, specifically when you are testing a new product or expanding into something and you really want to understand what value props are hitting the best. It's a little bit more challenging with like a YouTube or TikTok style ad where it's a 30 to 60 second script to really understand here's a differentiator. You can do certain things where, you know, the first four seconds is a different value prop, but um, these like static images that are billboard style, it's either, you know, this offer or that offer, this value prop or that value prop you really can clearly see, and then you can use those learnings to inform some of the maybe longer form kind of content you're developing. Yeah, that's a really good point. And so we just started this sort of two week sprints. And so far, um, the test is showing the strongest performance in one of the static ads um, in terms of actual like conversion rate into orders. But it's really interesting because the ad itself is like very straightforward. It's literally like our nuts.com box. It's open. There's product like coming out of the box and it's static and it's right in your face. Like this is our product. This is what you're getting. And it makes sense that that would perform really well from a conversion rate standpoint. There's one other ad that is a video. It's actually of my son. He's three and he's like, unboxing the box and he's had the product before and he loves it. So there's a product that we have that's chocolate covered gummy bears. So he's like ripping the things out of the box and each one he takes out, he's like, 
are these my chocolate covered gummy bears? Are these my chocolate covered gummy bears? And it's like, it's really cute and sweet and like UGC style. Um, and the click through rate is about 3.6% when all the other click through rates are between like one to one and a half percent. So it just like blew it out of the water for click through rate, but the conversion rate into orders is just not there yet. So it's really interesting that sort of dynamic of like what gets people to engage and click on your ad might be different from what gets people to actually like place an order. Yeah, for, for sure. My creative brain is kind of spinning with uh, there, there's a lot of cool ideas you could do with, with nuts.com. And I think uh, audio is a specific one. The sounds that nuts make as you're eating them, like there's probably a lot of cool things you could do to create that thumb stop. Yeah. Um, when someone's scrolling. So that that's really cool. Yeah. Um, just kind of uh, changing pace a little bit, going back to just kind of budget optimization. You know, I have a, I have a ton of experience in optimizing pay channels as well, right? The Facebook, the, the, the TikToks. And now what I found, find myself doing is becoming more interested in some of these sort of, I was, I would say they're paid channels. Some people refer to them as non-paid channels that still can affect CAC. One of the ones that I'm particularly interested in is how do you work with influencers? The reason for this is I, I see, I see strategies like SEO, um, influencer marketing podcasts, being things that can create this predictable engine for you that will kind of over time lower your CAC. Sometimes the volatility of Facebook is hard to manage, but if you can start to incorporate some of these more foundational elements into your media mix, it kind of allows you to, um, to yeah, improve performance. So I'm curious, uh, have you done a lot of work with, with influencers in, in the past and, and also the thing that I'm really curious about is how do you think about pricing that stuff out? Do you do a commission? Do you, you know, buy on a CPM? Just curious how you kind of stood up influencer programs. Yeah. Um, so I actually have a lot of experience in that. Um, so Skillshare is really huge in the influencer space, specifically on YouTube. Um, that was basically like their number one growth engine. It was over 50% of their acquisition month to month. Uh, so they had a huge influencer program. I think they were like number two or number three out of all the companies in the entire U.S. doing um, YouTube influencers. So we did a lot of that. We did um, like Instagram as well. It wasn't as as big, but basically like the setup was working with these individual influencers and you kind of have to a little bit play by their rules. Um, in, it's always like a, a lump sum sort of payment. Like they do either a single spot for like a little bit more, or they really like to do multiple. So like they like you to sign on for like three spots for them, for them to drop over, you know, whether you want to do like once a month or once every other month, but you're kind of like signed on for multiple. Um, and then they'll drop sort of that per spot rate, but you basically then have to back out to like, what do we think the CAC is going to look like here? Um, and it, it's a lot of guessing, I think, in the beginning until you really start to ramp it up and you start to understand like how the different uh, influencers and categories perform. Um, and then it gets to be a little bit more predictable. You know, there's ones that you work with on a monthly basis and you generally know what the CAC is going to look like. Um, so you can start building it up. I think that that strategy worked really well for, for Skillshare because it was sort of a unique business and it aligned really well with YouTube. So um, Skillshare, for anyone who doesn't know, it's um, basically like online tutorial style videos and classes um, leading into creative topics. So how they got started was, you know, they needed to build out the sort of instructor, like teacher side of their marketplace. Um, and what they did is they worked with the YouTubers to do that. 
Um, so these people creating content on YouTube to teach these skills, then created courses and classes on Skillshare. Um, and because of that sort of like symbiotic relationship, um, these same people who had their own course on Skillshare were then promoting the course to their audience. Like it just kind of like, you know, handshake and it flowed back and forth. So I think it worked really well for them. Um, I tried to do this at my next company, Career Karma, um, the one where I was kind of the first marketing hire and building everything out from scratch. It was successful in some ways where it was actually like our, our best quality leads came through those channels. Um, but it was a lot of work to stand up and it didn't have that sort of symbiotic relationship between the two platforms. Um, so while we saw strong performance in like those really niche creators who were so career karma was also in the boot camp space. Um, so these creators talking about, you know, careers in tech and um and boot camps in general, they were the ones who, yeah, it worked really well and it was efficient spend and the quality was really strong. But then as soon as you sort of started to branch out a little bit, um, then it it didn't back out to the the CAC that we needed, basically. Um, so that's, I think, where it gets hard for people. And I've talked to a lot of people at a lot of different companies, you know, about acquisition and growth. And they sort of hit those same roadblocks a lot of the time where, yeah, you can sort of stand up a program, but it's a lot of work. And it is. It's a lot of like back and forth work between the creators and like relationship building um, and all of that. So there's no it's not like an easy self-service platform like Facebook where you just turn it on and everything's great. So it's tough. I think it works for some companies and maybe not so much for others if they're if they're super niche. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I've seen so far. Yeah, the Skillshare one, I've seen a, a ton of ads. Um, when a, I watch a YouTuber called Ali Abdal and he has... Yeah, he was like one of our biggest ones. Of course. More tactically into that, was a lot of that stuff, I'm going to do a 15 to 30 second plug to Skillshare at a mid, mid roll, kind of pre-roll point in the, the video and then link out to a link. Is that kind of how you were measuring that for the most part? Yeah. So there's like the link in the, in the description and that's what actually, it's interesting because it's different from podcasts where, you know, when you're setting up podcasts, you're like, sure, let's, you know, let's put the tagged link in the podcast description. Nobody's going to click on that, but there's actually a lot of traffic to that link within the YouTube description. Um, you always have to make sure that they put it above the fold because that's something sometimes they'll like bury it down and then the campaign will bomb. Um, and that's why. So there's just sort of like little nuances. But yeah, you actually do get a lot of traffic through the link in the description of the YouTube video. What's your thoughts on doing it without an offer? Do you think uh, an offer is like table stakes? You need to have an offer for that type of Absolutely. Meeting? Yeah, we were doing some offer testing at Skillshare as well. And like, even when we changed up the offer, um, it would make a huge difference in the performance of the campaign. Um, so yeah, definitely having the right offer is is key for those channels. Yeah, for sure. Any of those any of those media buys that are taking place in that organic space to improve that click through rate, I'm looking into doing some QR code based stuff soon, offer based. And I think to myself, you know, if someone's watching a TV ad with a QR code, the only way they're going to take out their phone is if it's in their face and it's like a, oh shit, great offer. I need to take this. If it's soft, it's, it's not going to get, if it's just like a learn more style type of call to action, I don't think it works. Yeah. Yeah. We actually do a lot of TV at at nuts. Uh, so that's, that's been fun to jump into that world. Cause that's a little bit new for me. Um, and the way that we measure the effectiveness of TV is a lot through the, the post-purchase survey. Uh, we have that at Skillshare as well. I, I feel like that's something that's a little bit unspoken in, in our world. Um, but it's a, it's a big part of measurement. Um, at Skillshare, we would give like 
a halo to different channels um, based on what the survey said. Uh, so we do a little bit of that here at Nuts too, but we mostly use it to measure TV. Uh, and it's it's been a really interesting channel to stand up because we've been able to do it in uh, sort of like a your standard paid acquisition sense where we're measuring CAC and we're measuring, um, you know, the, the LTV of those people over time. We're doing remnant buys through an agency that uses this like AI platform to, to find all of these different places. Uh, so it's been really effective for us. We've been able to scale pretty significantly. Um, but yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to scale if we didn't have that sort of post-purchase survey to, to be able to understand the impact of TV. To validate it a little bit more. Yeah, that makes sense. I know we have a, a few minutes left. I do have a couple of kind of like ending questions, but the, the last kind of topic I wanted to get into was working with cross-functional teams. And the reason I mentioned this is that I think a lot of times paid teams specifically are held to targets and acquisition goals that they alone do not impact. Of course, there's macroeconomic and seasonal conditions that affect things, but a lot of times there are changes in product and life cycle, and there's a lot of levers outside of that paid mix that can affect the CAC to LTV that these paid teams are, are held to. So I'm curious, like, how do you kind of think about that and, and working with product and lifecycle teams to, to solve those challenges? When is it, hey, we've kind of squeezed as much juice as we can on the, the paid side and we really need a conversion rate or a product win here, or we really need a new lifecycle program. How do you kind of start to like sense that out? Absolutely. Uh, that's a huge part of my job. I think that that's something that you know, over time in my career, I've gotten really good at. And for people earlier on in their careers, definitely focus there. Because uh, if you're able to sort of easily build those cross-functional relationships and sort of get those people in your pocket, it's going to make such a huge difference. Um, so that's that's been really fun to sort of like build out that arm over time. Uh, and yeah, I agree. You know, we hit on this earlier sometimes there's only so many optimizations and levers you can pull within the platforms. And like, you really need, like you said, that product win. That's something that I'm working on right now at Nuts. It happened a lot at Career Karma as well. Um, that one was fun since it was an earlier stage startup. I worked really closely with the product team um, and we were able to make a lot of changes really quickly. Um, I actually in that role reported into one of the three co-founders who is the CTO, so the chief technology officer. And he also oversaw the uh, engineering team, which was very unique and amazing um, because he was able to, to you know, pull in resources to do these product changes really quickly, like same day. It was amazing. Um, and even sometimes like if the team was busy, he had an engineering background as well. So he had been to a boot camp. And it was his company. So he's like, I'm just going to jump in and do it. It's awesome. Um, so that was amazing. It is rare to have that. Um, so, you know, in these more traditional organizations like I'm in right now, uh, I think being able to form those relationships um, and have these cross-functional leaders sort of trust in your vision um, and get them on your side um, and be able to influence the the roadmap is so critical. Cannot emphasize that enough. Um, so yeah, I agree. So that's something that we're looking at right now of, um, for example, if we want to try this sort of quiz flow and we need bundling functionality. Um, so you have to sort of be able to pitch your idea, how you think it's going to be different from what we have now, what the potential impact is going to be. Um, and yeah, get them really bought into your idea uh, and sort of lay out like your quarterly roadmap, for example, and compare it to what, what they have. How can you slot in in your pieces? How do you think that maybe your ideas might have a bigger impact than some of the other things that they're thinking of? So product and marketing, I think there's a huge overlap. That might be one of the most important ones. I have a little bit of a harder time on the life cycle side. Um, I feel like 
And maybe it's because we're on the same team. Like I put a little bit more trust in in what they're doing and their sort of workflow. Like I know that they're focused on increasing the LTV. Um, you know, I'll pop in my ideas here and there. Um, but generally, like, I think that they're working towards the right things. I just need to make sure, like, I have an eye on what's going on or I'm able to flag if anything's like going wrong, for example, and make sure that, that we're all on the same page. Um, so I generally sort of let them do their thing. Uh, and then other cross-functional relationships that are really important is data team, for example, like making sure we're measuring things correctly. Um, so that's a huge one. Um, and then more recently, even uh, the creative team, since that's one of the biggest levers I feel like we still have um, getting kind of in in with that team to make sure that they're able to to provide the the assets and the assistance that you need to to sort of do this rapid testing. Yeah, for sure. I feel like I've done a lot more to partner with the the creative and uh, data teams a little bit less so product product and and on the lifecycle side. I'm starting to think more about you know learning more about what kind of abandonment messaging and things like that are working that we can start to incorporate in like retargeting campaigns and, and things like that. Um, That's a good idea. So, yeah. But there's so, it, it's funny uh, being at uh, startups that are fast paced, high growth, some throwing a cross-functional meeting on the calendar that doesn't exist and connecting people that are, you know, testing messaging. It's like, wow, you're doing this and this worked and we didn't know about this. Um, it can be such a, a quick win. So last couple of questions. This is called the Efficient Spend Podcast. Um, what is the most efficient marketing spend that, that you've gone through? And what's the most inefficient? If you can think of some, some times in your career. Yeah. I mean, again, I think this <laughs> this goes back to how you're measuring. So I will put this in the lens of last click since that's unfortunately the world that I've been living in for quite a while. Um, but in terms of efficiency, Google search has been kind of my, my baby, my pride and joy over the years, um, especially for, for last click, it works really, really well. Um, there's a ton of scale uh, if you're able to kind of be, be smart about it and be able to measure things down funnel. Um, that's that's really where you're able to win and kind of beat out your competitors. Things are changing there with the introduction of Pmax. Um, so that'll be interesting to see how that plays out um, and how you can sort of still have an edge over your competitors within something like Pmax. It's, that's super black box. Um, but so yes, yeah, so I'd say like Google non-brand search for sure on the efficient spend. Uh, Inefficient spends. <laughs> um, I think it depends for the different businesses, um, but I'm not a huge fan of display. Um, it actually works for nuts.com, surprisingly. So I can't knock it too much. Um, even from a last click perspective, they're able to make it work, which is astonishing in my book. Um, but anytime in the past when I've tried to run that, um, even sometimes at face value, it can look efficient, but the quality that's coming through is such crap. Um, it's it's definitely not worth it. Uh, but but who knows? It seems like we're able to make it work. Where we have a, a small campaign running on Google, um, but we're also running on Critio. Um, so maybe introducing sort of like different different partners can help because um, we are seeing success there. Yeah, a display and, and retargeting at some. Um some of those executions where on the last click, the CPA looks amazing. If you start to measure incrementality, if you start to track LTV a little bit more, you might be like, oh, okay. That's I'm real curious to bring on uh, the measurement platform and like see these channels tank and just cut them. <laughs> sure. Um, well, this was awesome, Sonia. And thank you so much for, for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it.